Hello, everyone. I'm Ted Oakley, managing partner here at Oxbow, and it is my great delight to have Dr. Lacey Hunt here. And I've, uh, and say Lacey's my friend, but he's also really a, quite a professional. And uh, it goes without saying that they have an incredible track record at Boysington in the treasuries. And I think what you need to get out of this today is understanding how much work that Lacey's done. He's probably been on more programs, more networks, more interviews, more articles, books, et cetera, than anybody I know. So you'll get a lot out of this if you'll follow him on inflation, debt, and what happens with the bond market. But Lacey, glad to have you today. Great pleasure to be with you, Ted. And you, we are good friends, and uh, we look forward to developing that even further as time goes by. Well, anyway, I'm going to let you kick it off. You've got some really interesting stuff for us here. All right. Thank you. Um, the, uh, the U.S. economy is in a very frail condition. Um, the structural problems that we face uh, are the worst in, in nine decades. Now, in addition to that, critical cyclical indicators are now deteriorating. And on top of that, um, the Federal Reserve uh, is engaged in a uh, very slow and tardy effort uh, to contain the inflation problem that is facing us all. And unfortunately, um, since uh, the founding of the Fed in 1913, when they've tightened, uh, they've had a very bad record. Soft landings have only occurred about 10% of the time. So those are the problems that we face. Let's, let's start with the, the critical, most critical structural, which is chart number one, which illustrates the deleterious effects that uh, our extreme over indebtedness is having on our standard of living. Um, the, the blue line, is the uh, compound rate of growth that occurred uh, from uh, the 1870s, where we have very good data, until the late 1990s. And what we've done is we've extrapolated the growth rate pre-late 90s going forward. The, the black line is the actual GDP that we have achieved uh, quarter by quarter since, since 2000. And, and notice that the, the blue line is growing at a considerably faster pace. Um, when the pandemic hit, uh, the black line was 17.5% uh, below the blue line. And now uh, the black line is at about uh, approaching $59,000. If we'd stayed on the blue line, we'd bid $71,000 per, per person. A big shortfall. Now, uh, economics um, is a science. We're, we're social science, not a physical science. But we are quantitative skills and technical capabilities have greatly increased over the decades. And one of the things that we can do is that we can ascertain what has caused things to happen in the past. We have difficulty going forward. If you go in to see your doctor, he can make an accurate diagnosis of what your problem is, but he doesn't know for sure whether you'll fully recover or whether you may not recover. And, and so what is causing this divergence, there are a lot of factors, some of them not terribly important, some are more important, but the most important one is the fact that we have become extremely over indebted. And this indebtedness is driving us down. And I'll, I'll provide some additional information later. So let's now look at chart number two, which is a, uh, a very critically important cyclical indicator. I cannot underemphasize the importance of your real average weekly earnings. Now study the chart and notice in the latest 12 months, ending in January, so we're, we already have our first reading for the new year, um, your real wages, your real weekly paycheck is down about two and a half percent. 
uh, which uh, takes out the low that we experienced in 2011. And the only reading that's, that's worse than in the last 12 months was in July of 2008. But, but if you look further back in the history of this chart, we we're, have we're worse uh, paycheck problem than we did when we entered the recession of 2000. And we're at comparable lever, levels where we started all of the previous recessions. This is, this is a very significant chart because 86% um, of our working folks earn less than $150,000. Now, there are the people that make above it, but there are not many of them. Now, um, why, why is this so terribly important? Uh, you might say, well, yes, this happened, but didn't we have a large number of jobs increase last year? And in fact, employment was up 6.6 .6 million. However, 125 million took a two and a half percent cut in their weekly paycheck. And that's a big, that's a big burden. And well, you may say, well, this of course doesn't include interest income, dividend income, doesn't include transfer payments from the government. But when we do that at the very top of the chart, we, we look at total disposable personal income, which includes the high earners, and transfer payment recipients and so forth. And our real disposable per capita income latest month is unchanged from where it was when the pandemic hit. Would you say, Lacey, uh, that that would be one of the reasons you can't have runaway inflation because they just can't afford it? You can't have it for very long. <laughs> and I mean. and uh, the, the other critical point that I was gonna make is that um, the Nobel laureate, Milton Friedman said, that when the inflation rate roars, like it has been continuing to roar. Um, the Federal Reserve is ill-advised to have more than one mandate, that the only mandate they should have is inflation. Because when, when you have inflation, you damage the most people. And um, so the, the current Federal Reserve um, operating with a dual mandate and maybe a lack of strategic vision failed to move against the inflation rate as it was moving higher. Now they said they were looking at the dual mandate. And so we have a benefit for 6.6 .6 million against this tremendous detriment. Now it's not surprising that our folks who are mainly wage earners uh, have turned extremely pessimistic. And I've also typed up there at the top of the chart uh, the latest numbers from the University of Michigan. They, they have the best surveying. Their survey started the earliest in the 1950s under the late Dr. George Catano. And uh, in the current five month period, uh, Michigan confidence is lower, is at the same levels as we were in each of the last four recessions. And if you look at, if you look at just the, the first five months of each of those recessions were actually lower. Our consumers are worried, and, and I'm going to make one other point. In just the last couple of months, the consumers have not only been uh, highlighting the decline in real income, but now they're saying for the first time that they expect their future income to continue dropping. Ted, you had a question, I think. Well, we're going to ask you on the on the Michigan consumer, didn't it break like eight or nine percent just in the last two months, too? I mean, yes, it's like 67 to 61 or something. A, you, you're exactly correct. It then um the we had big declines in um in four of the last five months, particularly sharp decline in February. Yeah. The consumer is worried, and rightly so. Um and um, so this is an extremely important cyclical indicator, um, but it's also an indication 
that if the Federal Reserve does not get the inflation rate content, uh, contained and, and these basic costs of food, fuel, and energy continue moving through the system uh, with the monetary restraint that's taking place, it, this is going to act as a giant um, regressive tax on our moderate and moderate income households. And, and so the Federal Reserve is, is charged with the task that they don't handle well. And it's, it's, so it's carrying dual messages, the, the, the vulnerability of the economy from a cyclical standpoint, but also an indication of, of the difficulties the Fed has. So let's go on to the third chart. Very significant one. Uh, this is the, the real long treasury yield since 1870. We have excellent data since then. I excluded the, the war years. And last year, um, in real terms, uh, the Treasury yield was negative, about 2.5%. Well, since 1870, excluding the war years, we have 130 observations. And in only 8% of the cases is the real yield negative. 11 cases before 2021, and then plus the one from last year. Now, now some folks may say, well, isn't that a good thing? Real interest rates are dropping. That'll stimulate economic activity. And in the world of holding everything else constant, or what we in e economics call ceteris paribus, that would certainly be the case. But we operate in the world where everything's changing at the same time, the Latin phrase, mutatis mutandis. And the drop in real interest rates is actually a confirmation of the deleterious effects of debt. Let's go to the next chart. Um, what you're looking at here is a summary of a um, article that was published uh, in one of the journals of the American Economic Association, 2012, more than a decade ago. Uh, by uh, Ken Rogoff at Harvard, Carmen Reinhardt, who's chief economist at the World Bank, and uh, Vincent Reinhardt, who was former director of research. Um, by the way, being peer reviewed, there, there are no errors in it. There, there was some uh, Reinhardt paper, Re Reinhardt and Rogoff paper in 09, where there was an Excel spreadsheet problem. There's no Excel spreadsheet problem here. And moreover, I'm going to show you confirming research by other scholars in just a minute. And uh, Lacey, uh, I wanted to mention something too. And I know for us professionals, we think we always just think about this, but there's a few people watching this uh, that probably don't understand real yield. Uh, I know it sounds real basic, but, mm -hmm. uh, but what Lacey's talking about is it, it subtracts the effects of inflation. Would that be fair enough, Lacey? You said it absolutely correctly. All right. You Thank get you. an A plus for that. <laughs> I'm still working on it. <laughs> Okay, so what, so what um, uh, our authors did here is they looked at 22 advanced economies where gross public debt exceeded 90% of GDP for five years. That, that way we excluded cyclical increases in debt and also the war years. And let's look at their main conclusions. Um, paragraph one, um, when, when, the, when this debt metric is met, you lose at least one third of your growth rate against trend. Um, point number two, uh, if you go back to my very first chart, look at the black line and the blue line. We've actually uh, lost 50% of our growth rate against trend. In other words, if we'd lost a third, we'd be growing 1.1% per annum since, since 1997. We're only growing 1.1. That's a big difference compounding four tenths of 1% for 20, 20 years, big difference. And uh, point number three, uh, this, the, this research has met the test of time and it's been confirmed by others. But the fourth paragraph is one I wanna draw your attention to with regard to real interest rates. And um, uh, these notable scholars write, Contrary to popular perception, 
we find that in 11 of the 16 debt overhang cases, the interest rates were lower or about the same than when the debt metric was not met. And they go on to conclude that those waiting for the financial markets to send a warning signal through higher real interest rates that governmental policy will be detrimental to economic performance may be waiting a long time. Debt, uh, over indebtedness is the stealth killer. And that's the difficulty that we face here. Let's go on to the next chart. And you know, now, Lacey, uh, I was gonna say this, don't you think uh, over indebtedness is the killer for anybody, anything, any business, any person, any, any, any absolutely government? Absolutely, and well said. I, um, uh, when, um, when, when I studied economics, I was taught that there was a very powerful Keynesian multiplier. And um, I remember my professor saying that uh, modern democracies, large scale industrial democracies, the laws of personal and, and uh, finance don't, don't apply to large scale governments that, that if they borrow money, they can spend it and they get this multiplier. What we've learned is that, that it, what holds on the individual, the household level, the state and local level. And I'm, I'm gonna show you really serious evidence of that. Um, by the way, uh, Keynes was a very witty fellow. And one of the things that he said was that um, there a lot of human misery have been, been caused by the theories of, of long dead economists. <laughs> what, what Keynes didn't realize is that applies to him and his multiplier theory. Uh, but that, that's where we are. Now, here's what's going on. Um, debt can be helpful. It can also be neutral and it can be negative. Uh, so what I'm describing to you is a nonlinear relationship. Everybody assumes that economics is accounting. It's not. If you do two trillion and two trillion doesn't work, you go for four. And then four doesn't work, well, then you, you go to eight. But if the relationship is nonlinear, that drives you deeper into the hole. What's at work here is the law of diminishing returns. If you begin to overuse debt, initially GDP rises, still overuse it, there's a neutral effect, and then ultimately it leads to diminishing returns. And we can see that by the next chart here, which is uh, the diminishing returns. We measure that by the marginal revenue product of debt. So um, I wanted to compare the US with Europe and Japan. And um, in the time period since the EU came into existence, um, we were, we were generating 35 cents of debt for every dollar of GDP. We're down to 25 and Europe's at 20 and Japan is at 15. Um, we're, we're very heavily over -debted. Our debt is, increases are very inefficient, but the problems are much greater in Europe and Japan. And what that means, if my theory is right, Japan and Europe should be doing worse than we are. And then that's exactly what the net chart shows. Um, what we did is we took the ratio of, of real per capita GDP to the US and Japan. The Japanese numbers are on the left-hand side of the chart, the European are on the right. So um, when the data first became available for all three of these areas, Japan was actually wealthier than the US. Their real per capita income was 7% higher. They were a very wealthy country. By the way, then they had a strong demographics. And now they're 13% below us uh, as, they, they, as they piled on debt with it increasingly poor results. And by the, the recently, on January 15th, the Japanese prime minister said they've been overstating the data, which they haven't yet corrected. Look at, look at where we are relative to Europe. Our real per capita GDP is 38% higher. So, so 
we can see the deleterious effect in terms of what's happening in the United States, but it's also confirmed that in the more indebted areas, they're doing worse than we are. So let's go to the next chart. I'm gonna take you through three uh, serious scholarly studies uh, that, that confirm and extend, extend the findings of Reinhardt, Rogoff, and Rogoff. Um, the, the first uh, article is a, another peer-reviewed publication of the American Economic Association. Uh, the authors are Swedish economists, uh, Harvard PhDs, Berg and Hendrickson. And here's what they find, a significant negative correlation between the size of government and economic growth. And they go on to point out, and this is really critical, the last sentence, this suggests that if spending increases, the government expenditure multiplier will become more negative over time. It's already negative, not positive like Kane said, but it's becoming more negative. Let's go to the second study done by economists from the London School of Economics, uh, the Wharton School and the University of Maryland. They find that the debt effects start having a deleterious effect at 60%. And they also say that government spending multiplier is sharply negative in these highly indebted economies. Goodbye to the Keynesian multiplier. Now the public may believe that, the politicians in Washington may believe that, but the fact of the matter is there is no positive case. If, if, you, if you borrow a lot of money and spend it, you do get a transitory blip. We saw this with the shovel-ready projects of 09. The economy's growth rate lifted for about one to two quarters. The tax cuts of 2018, we received a lift of one to two quarters. We borrowed five and a half trillion dollars to try to alleviate the pandemic in three different installments. We had one to two good quarters and then the economy. The, the benefit came and left, but the debt remains. And we trigger the law of diminishing returns. The last study, um, Christina Checherita, now Westfall, is director of fiscal affairs of the, Europe, of the European Central Bank. Dr. Checherita holds a degree from a U.S. major U.S. university. Her co-author is Dr. Philip Rother. He's chief economist of the European Economic Commission. And they find this deleterious effect as well. And they, they notice that the relationship is nonlinear. The debt bites a little bit at lower levels. And then the effect intensifies it. So ask yourself what in economics is nonlinear? And that's the law of diminishing returns. It's, they're basically describing a parabola. And that, that's where we are. There's nothing to be gained. Now let's talk about monetary policy. This is very critical. Um, we're first of all gonna talk about the money multiplier. Now the money multiplier should not be confused with the velocity of money. I'm gonna to get to the velocity of money. Um, but let's look at how the multiplier is defined. I've got some numbers in the upper uh, left-hand corner. Our money supply is, is 21.6 trillion. And it is equal to this formula, the monetary base, which is 6.4 trillion times the multiplier, which is 3.36. Now the monetary base has two components. Uh, total reserves, which are 4.2. Those are the Fed's liabilities. Fed's liabilities are not medium of exchange. They're not money. They have to be converted into money with the bank, with the operation of the banking system. Uh, and currency is 2.2 trillion. Now, if you look at the formula, M2 equals the base times the money multiplier. There's a good way to understand it here. The base is supply the multiplier is demand. So the Fed can create supply, but it cannot create demand. And that's where we are. Now let's look at what's happened here. I have a little table there at the bottom of the chart. And I want you to compare the total reserves column 
with the uh, deposits of the commercial banks. The, the deposits of the commercial bank are the dominant component of M2. About 77% of it. And moreover, it's, the, it's, it is, it's, 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 it's what makes M2 M2. Uh, currency, that doesn't support loans. Money market mutual funds, people can write limited number of checks, but they don't support loans. They can support buying of short paper. But the, this is the active ingredient in M2. So in 2020, total reserves increased 92.3%. That is not a time problem. That was part of the coordination of monetary and fiscal policy. And then last year, total reserves increased 34%. Those are the two largest yearly increases ever. And reflecting that, your other deposits were up nearly 27% in 2020 and up 13.8% uh, in 2021. Now, last November, the Federal Reserve announced that they were going to end their buying of government and mortgage paper. They were buying 80 billion of treasuries, 40 of mortgages. And so they, they, they indicated that they were tapering. Right now, uh, they're buying the last 20 billion of treasuries. A month from now, they'll be finished buying. But let's, let's look what's happened to total reserves during this time period. So on, on December the 15th, your total reserves were about $4.25 trillion. As of uh, the numbers last week, released Thursday, late Thursday night, they're down to 3.77. So they've, the Fed has reduced the total reserves by about 480 billion. Now, what they did is they still bought mortgages and, and, and governments, but there were operating factors like currency and certain other deposit categories at the bank, treasuries mainly, the, the Fed did not offset those. And so they engineered an 11.4% decline in total reserves, not at an annual rate. They, they, they really whack reserves and they're finishing up the buying. And look, look how other deposits have responded. So they were at uh, 16 and a half trillion. They're barely above that. And they're only growing at a 2.9% annual rate. Historically, uh, other deposits have grown closer to nine. So from growing way above the long-term trend, they brought it under. Now, another thing has helped them. Um, when, when the Fed started tapering, we saw a very dramatic rise in the short-term rates because most of the buying was in the short end of the curve. And so they really pulled that support. And um, as a consequence, the yield curve has flattened very dramatically. Uh, the two-year note prior to tapering was, was 25 basis points. It's approaching 1.6%. Uh, the intermediate, the longer intermediates and the long bond have gone up, but not nearly as much. Well, the yield curve compression is a very critical variable. It has a tremendous impact on bank profitability. So the banks prior to the, the, the tapering uh, were picking up an extra 100, 125 basis points of income on all their new purchases, which is now gone. And, but the Fed has work to do. And so not only is the yield curve flattening, there is a very significant risk that it's going to invert this curve. And when that happens, the risk of a recession is, is virtually assured, virtually assured, very difficult. Um, now, you may say, well, the, the Fed shouldn't allow the yield curve to invert that they should hold up. Well, if they do that, then they don't get the inflation rate down and you then leave 125 million households dangling in the wind because their real income is dropping very significantly. I'll give you a little example. Um, when I went into the Federal Reserve Board, uh, Federal Reserve at Dallas in 1969, uh, William McChesney Martin was chairman of the Fed and he made the famous 
statement that it's the Fed's job to take away the inflationary punch bowl when the party's getting out of control. And in 1966, the inflationary punch bowl of the Vietnam War was running muck. And he started tightening. And he engaged in several rounds until he aggravated then President Lyndon Johnson. And Johnson put tremendous pressure on Martin not to continue with the job. And, and so Martin pulled back. In 19, one of the soft landings that the Federal Reserve engineered was in 1967 because they pulled back. But what then happened? The inflation rate got out of control and Martin had to tighten even more in 68, then Burns further. And we had two recessions to deal with the, infl with the recession, one in 1969 and 70, and then another in 73 and 75. So the Federal Reserve is tasked with an almost impossible job and there are a lot of complexities in the outlook. If, if they don't go, they leave a, a, a myriad of folks in, in great stress. And they also risk that the problem becomes greater, presenting themselves with a more difficult job down the road. Let's go to the next chart. We now want to talk about the velocity of money. Um, it's money times velocity that determines GDP. The Fed has a loose control on money but they have no control whatsoever over velocity. And that's your, your red line here. And I indexed it to one in 1952. The blue line is a weighted average of the marginal revenue product of debt, which you saw earlier, and the loan to deposit ratio. And in other words, when debt is productive and you, you create new credit, velocity rises. If it's not productive, velocity falls. And you see that in this, in this relationship. In other words, there's a time when velocity rises, flattens out, and then goes, you know, this is, look, look back at the whole graph. That's your parabola. That's a nonlinear relationship. And, and notice where velocity is today. It's at an all-time record low. The money multiplier is at an all-time record low which basically means that when, when the Federal Reserve has to try to make things better later on, monetary policy will be very ineffectual. And the reason it's ineffectual is that they've allowed too much debt to be created. And if we go and look at the velocity situation outside the US, the green line is the US, Europe, you can see Japan and China. Money's not even turning over one time per year in Europe, only 0.84. And in Japan and China, the situation where indebtedness is greater than here, the level of velocity. So not only is, is, has debt been overused in the United States, but it's been overused in all of the major economies of the world. So would you say, uh, Lacey, that it would take maybe a year and a half in these countries to even do one times or maybe longer, maybe two years I mean, to do one time even? It, it's going to be a slow process. We, the lags are very unknown here. I, I will say this from my perspective, it doesn't really matter whether the federal funds raises the federal funds rate or whether they shrink the balance sheet. Uh, if they don't raise the policy rate, the Fed funds rate will stay at zero. But if they allow the balance sheet to roll off, which is they're considering as an alternative, what will happen is that the two and three year notes will rise rapidly. And so you won't, you may not invert the curve from the overnight rate to the longer, but you'll get the two to three year notes above the rest of the curve. Right. And so, but it has the same effect and the, the, the damage to the, to the banks will, will be equivalent. So I wanna look at, a, do a little theoretical economics this is your general equilibrium model. So um, the aggregate supply curves upward sloping firms will sell more when the price is higher. So um, before the pandemic hit, we were operating uh, at aggregate supply curve zero. 
and aggregate demand zero. Uh, when you get supply side disruptions, the whole aggregate supply curve shifts upward. And so the, uh, the price level increases. Now, if once we unwind the aggregate, the, the, the supply side disruptions, the aggregate supply curve will shift backward. But in the meantime, the Federal Reserve is now shifting the aggregate demand curve downward. Uh, because the aggregate demand curve is equal to money times velocity. And, and when the economies are very over indebted, velocity helps the Fed get the job done. And so the, the, even though the inflation rate is very high today and it's hurting a lot of folks, um, we're sowing the seeds for its reversal. Timing is very uncertain. So with that, Lacey, would you say just in general that that's going to be a tough period for the banks, the way that looks the next three years or so? Well, you know, I spent 26 years in banking. Right. Work. I was at HSBC in the days when it was the largest bank in the world, most profitable bank in the world. And of course, I was in the Chase organization early in my career, and then the largest bank in Philadelphia. Um, I, I wouldn't want to try to have to make money in banking. Yeah. Now, maybe there's some creative new way that I don't know about, but um, the, 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 what the banks have to do, let me go back, can, let's go back and look at the multiplier chart. Okay. It's a very great question you just added, asked the Fed. So we go back to the money multiplier chart. So um, let's just look at where the multiplier is. It, it's, as you can see, it's right now um, about three and a third Historically, it's been 7.7. .7. Remember, multiplier is demand. Um, in the textbooks, quite incorrectly, you're taught that if you have a 100% reserve requirement, the base equals the money supply. In other words, the banks have to have a deposit at the Fed for every dollar they give out. So in that case, the multiplier would be zero. But you're also taught that if the reserve requirement were one tenth of 1%, uh, the multiplier would be a thousand using the binomial theorem. Okay, so look at the multiplier there. The Fed eliminated reserve requirements in March of 2020, in April of 2020. And the multiplier rose for a little bit. It's, it's declining once again. Now, the, the reason it's declining is that the, the Fed has pumped this more than $4 trillion of reserves into the banking system, all of which can be used. But for the banks to use them, they have to cover their costs. And they have three basic costs. They have the cost of money, uh, which is still low, but, uh, but in the two-year area, three-year area, the cost is going up. So you, it's very increasingly difficult to arbitrage from two to seven or two to 10. Um, then they have to pass through their overhead cost, but they also have to pass through the risk premium. Because when you make a loan, you're not sure that that loan is going to be repaid. Now, the lending officers will always make the case. That the loan <laughs> That's true. Be uh pits the economist and the lending officers <laughs> uh and you know Lacey, uh for all the uh non uh business or economic people out there just a just a one-line description of the, the money multiplier uh, because i don't think most people understand that the uh, the relationship between reserves and end product you might just give me a one sentence on that well it it's the it's the extent to which uh, the banks can take $1 of reserves and, and create more loans and deposits than a dollar. Right. What it is. And um, uh, when, the, when the multiplier is falling, it's an indication that the banks cannot um, 
put the reserves to work because they cannot cover the risk premium. And as economies become more heavily indebted, the risk premium rises. The, the, the monetary policy works through several channels. The overnight policy rate, which I don't really think is that important, gets a lot of attention. Then it works through, uh, through reserves, through money supply, and then you have to have the, the cooperation of the banks. And in the, in the current environment, the, 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 the multiplier tells you that the cost structure facing the banks, including the risk premium, is very high at the present time. Don't you find it interesting, though, that most of the banks have gotten really excited about four or five rate increases, that uh, they're obviously going to make more money, et cetera, et cetera. But it, se it seems as though they don't ever understand the other side of the equation. <laughs> well, if they're, if they, if all, if, if they're, if they, they have, if they're not utilizing the investment portfolio for a substantial portion of their income, they may be okay. But the fact of the matter is all of the big banks are intensively utilizing the investment. So in other words, they've got a bar short and long. And when the yield curve inverts, it, it, it becomes very, very difficult for them. I, I don't, um, and by the way, the economy pays the price too. And a yield curve inversion uh, is, is a very powerful force when it's combined with a monetary deceleration. Not something to be fooled with. Um, so it, it, it creates a difficulty. And I think the Fed is aware, but, but, but here is, is Friedman's point. Last year when inflation moved above, what Friedman would have done is he would have attacked the problem. He would have said, you've got to protect the majority of people, but they didn't. Right. They let the situation get worse. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so now they're tasked with an even more monumental job. You know, um, uh, the Dallas Fed had a president, Rob Kaplan, probably many of you knew, uh, Rob did his darndest to get the Federal Reserve to at least stop buying $40 billion of mortgages after the housing market set new peaks, both in terms of activity and prices, but they continue doing it. Right. And, and so now rents are rising and, you know, um, uh, it, it, it fueled uh, problems in the food and fuel sector. Uh, we don't have good substitutes for that. So when those prices rise, um, moderate and moderate income households don't have substitutes. And so it really puts a lot of pressure on them. And, and so I, I, really, I really don't know where the Fed's heads was. I mean, yes, we have the new jobs, but the economy is ultimately worse off. I want to uh, conclude my chart presentation here with one final chart. Uh, it's not used very much in economics, but it's so, so critical. Uh, what you're looking at here is net national saving as a percent of national income. Now, net national saving has three components. Private, the private would be household and corporate. Uh, that, that's S sub P in the little equation up there. And then the government, which is the deficit, and then the foreign contribution. Now, you'll notice that I gave you a little formula. I equals F. I is physical investment, not, not financial. This is the hard stuff. You know, plant, equipment, technology, stuff, that, stuff that's going to grow the economy over time. I don't mean to demean, demean financial investment, but financial investment doesn't generate uh, economic growth. You, you need the green line to, to be able to rise. Now, um, look at the dash line there. That's the average um, investment in saving rate since 1929 when the data became available, 6.3. Um, right now, the green line is around 2%, a little bit better. So we're four percentage points below the historic average. 
notice that with the exception of one little spurt there in the late 1990s, the green line has been trending downward for a long time. And that coincides with the debt buildup. So as we've taken on more debt, we undermine growth. Government doesn't like that. And so what they try to do is take on more debt to solve the problem, but it makes the situation worse off. Um, and so, so look at the, the red line. Um, we ran a, ran a deficit the last two years of 12 and 14% of GDP. By the way, those eclipsed the, pro, the, debt, the deficit during World War II. You can see it on the chart. Now we the private saving was 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 the gray area was pretty good, but net national saving is is very poor. So if you if you try to solve an indebtedness problem by taking on more debt using fiscal policy, what you basically do is you create less saving and less investment, and you and that that reinforces the problem now. Uh, in conclusion, I want to talk about one other structural factor uh, that, that gets lost in the uh, shuffle, and that is demographics. Uh, our demographics are deteriorating very badly. Last year, our population only increased 300,000, about one-tenth of one percent. Uh, it was the slowest since the 18th century. Last year was the first time when our population grew less than a million since 1937. The fertility rate was at an all time low when the pandemic hits even lower now. Family formation dropping. Um, now, why is demographics so important? Well, demographics has a tremendous impact on investment. Think of the cost of, of marriage, raising a family, educating a family. Uh, think of the cost of investment to the firms that supply the household. Think of the impact on state and local governments. So when you get poor demographics, you undermine investment. And, and so when you get over indebted and that, that slows the economic growth rate and, and you pursue that policy strong long enough, then you begin to undermine your demographics. Now, the, the only good thing about this is that in relative terms, our demographics are stronger than Europe, Japan, and China. The average age in the United States is 38. It's, it's much older everywhere else. In, in China, the average age is now more than 40. And every two years, the average age in China goes up one year. And, uh, you know, they had the, well, the two, one child per family and so forth. We got to miss that. But, but the Europeans didn't have those. All they had was deteriorating economic activity and they've stopped having babies and, and having family formation. Uh, because it's not always uh, personal issues do affect demographics, but economics plays a role. People have to have resources. And when they don't have resources, then demographics suffer. And when demographics suffer, suffer that then um, has a, a reinforcing impact. Now, there's, there's one final cyclical element uh, that is entering the picture uh, that is going to make a, a, a big difference here at, at, at some point. Uh, when the pandemic hit, our firms were practicing a very strict form of just-in-time inventories. The theory was that you really kept your inventories under tight control because you knew that you could, you could replenish on a telephone call and have it air delivered or what have you, mm -hmm. and the product would be available the next day. So when the, pan when the pandemic hit, uh, we were in the worst possible situation because of just-in-time inventories. Now, however, what's taking place is we're seeing a massive swing 
into just-in-case inventories. And um, uh, so in the second half of last year, if you take out the inventory component, and it's what we in economics call final sales, the growth rate was 1%. Right. The difference was this huge uh, replenishment of inventories. Now, inventories have somewhat further to go, but with the consumer under such pressure of their real, and with the yield curve flattening and monetary restraint coming out of the system, uh, the consumer is not going to be in a sustaining uh, and expansive mode. And so this switch on the inventory side is going to, in, at some point in time, is going to become excessive. And so the um, there will be individual months when economic activity will appear to spurt, but um, we're looking at a very difficult environment. Wall Street uh, has a soft first quarter, but then a recovery in the second, later on in the year, it, it's my view that economic activity is gonna be very difficult for the entire year. Mm. Small spasmodic gains, but the pattern is one of, of a weaker growth pattern. And based on that, Lacey, and I know, uh, I know where you are on this, but I don't think everybody does, but based on that, you would expect from this point forward, I believe, I'm not speaking for you here, it's a question, uh, their treasuries to do better in terms we of- We expect them to do better. We may, we may have, have some difficulty in front of us here for a while, but but we, we have a very long duration at Hoysington Management. And uh, our approach is to stay focused on the long run situation. And I would, uh, I have two or three questions, but I would recommend people on that count to take a look at the Hoysington Fund. You have a wonderful <laughs> track record uh, well, for you. sure, and especially all treasuries. A couple of things though, Lacey, um, one of them is a question we have from uh, investor was, what, what happens if the Fed denies everything and just keeps on raising rates here because they're sort of blinded to what's going on? What, what's, what's the outcome of that, in your opinion? Well, the yield curve will invert and we'll have a recession. Yeah. The second but part, it, yeah, but the thing part, about it is uh -huh. it may be just as equally bad as if they say we've achieved what we wanted to do and we're not doing any more because then inflation will remain high and then instead of having 125 million households having their weekly paycheck cut, <laughs> the number will grow. Right. And so uh, is, for them. is there any, and so uh, you know, we hear this question a lot, and that is, okay, if oil keeps on rising, uh, you see there's any chance you could go into a late seventies, early 80 type of inflation. You were, obviously well around during that period. So any, uh, any chance of that? Okay, so in the 1970s, we had all those oil shocks. And so from the early 70s to the peak there in the early 80s, we went from $2 a barrel to $40 or thereabouts. Um, in, the, in, the, in the 1970s, however, as the inflation rate started rising, uh, first under Arthur Burns and then under later under G. William Miller, um, the Federal Reserve did not attack the problem. And they, they allowed the money supply growth to increase. So the, the, the fastest 10 year period of dec the fastest decade of money growth was the 1970s. Um, the, in addition, at that point in time, the velocity of money was stable. So the aggregate demand is money times velocity. So in that particular case, the aggregate demand curve kept shifting outward mm. and they allowed the price increases to be passed forward until the inflation rate became intolerable. And, and President Carter brought in Paul Volcker. And that came back to your uh, demographic thing. 
the demographics were much different then too. Yeah. Last question for you. Uh, and I think it goes back to the next saving, next saving uh, graph, maybe, but I've asked you this before, but is there any hope? Uh, what's the hope of us getting back to where, uh, you know, debt to GDP is at a level, what, I don't know what you think is good, 30, 35% or something. Any hope of that? I mean, what, what happens to us here? Well, this question has been asked by someone far more capable than me, McKinsey Global Institute, which is the think tank of McKinsey and Associates. You can go on, on their website and, and purchase the study done in 2010. And they look at these 24 advanced economies uh, that became extremely over indebted. And so they, they charted the buildup of debt they looked at the damage caused by the excessive indebtedness. And then they looked at how the debt problem was solved. And in all 24 cases, all advanced economies in the time period between 1900 and 2008, they said that it required austerity. Now, the way they defined it is in terms of national saving. Now, if you look at the last chart, my last chart, the net saving by sector. Um, they said that to cure the problem, there had to be a sustained uh, rise in net national saving. In other words, you had to, if the indebtedness is living beyond your means and then correcting it is living inside your means. So it, you can see one of the examples they gave was the U.S. during the World War II period. Notice we, we ran deficits there approaching 14%, but see the gray area mm -hmm. on the chart? Right. That, that was your private, say we had mandatory rationing during World War II. And it was a period actually of austerity, it wasn't planned, uh, but we had the rationing. And so the net private saving was 25 and we paid off the indebtedness of the 1920s and 1930s. Now here's the problem from my standpoint. The bulk of our people are already hurting. They can't vote for austerity. And so we're basically stuck with trying to solve an indebtedness problem by taking on more debt, which is what Japan has been doing now for three and a half decades, Europe for almost three decades. China is now doing that and we're doing it. In other words, it's the dilemma of a, of a democracy. I, I will tell you that um, the Nobel laureate Friedman um, realized that this risk was there uh, back in the, in the late 70s, early 80s. And he pushed very, very hard for a constitutional amendment to require a balanced budget unless there was a super majority vote of 60%. In other words, he didn't, want to, he didn't want budget deficits to be run as a matter of fact every year. And at that particular point in time, there was actually a lot of bipartisan support. And the, the Friedman constitutional amendment passed both the House and the Senate, Reagan was president, and it carried a majority vote, but it didn't get the two thirds vote. And it required a two thirds vote to go to the states for ratification. So I, I think that, that Friedman anticipated that this would be the, the, the way we would go. And in fact, unfortunately he was correct, but I, I don't see any way to get out of it, frankly. Mm -hmm. if, 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 because we're, we're hurting so badly already and, and you cannot sell austerity. And there is a simplistic notion that, that we, you know, all we have to do is borrow more money and somehow we'll kickstart the economy. And there's no realization that borrowing the additional money not only makes us worse off, but it makes us worse off at an accelerating pace. Very difficult dilemma we're in. Lacey, listen, I want to uh, thank you and for all you people out there, you can, See Dr. Lacey Hunt's uh, 
fun Hoisington. Uh, certainly go check it out. And Lacey, I'll tell you, you are um, you're a teacher. You, you well, explain more things to more people than anybody <laughs> I've ever known. But I want to thank yeah, you. You're a good friend. You know, I think you're too kind. I, yeah. I want to thank you for asking me to uh, present to your clients. Thank you very much. But we, uh, we appreciate it. And I'll tell you, until next time, um, we we'll certainly hope to have you back. I'll be glad to do it anytime, Ted. My pleasure. All right. Thanks a lot.